What can we say that, <coughs> pardon me, what can we say that would not detract from what we have experienced here the last few days? Our hearts rejoice and praise God for seeing the marvels of his grace and his strength and his might. I have a message here this morning that been on my mind for years already, and yet I was always a little hesitant to do it, especially since we're on the air now. But I believe the Lord gave instructions for this, this round. I've entitled the message, Biblical Separation During the Christmas Season. We are in the Christmas season. I live close by a town <coughs> where it's very evident that we're in the Christmas season. You might say, why this subject? I have three reasons why I have chosen this round to, uh, or this time to share this message. First of all, one of the reasons is in Romans 12, 2, where it tells us, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As I think of a transformed heart, its desires are to be a watchman and to inform of danger, shout out warnings, is concerned about the future generations. Where are we at in our feelings in relation to the Christmas season and its um, things that people do and that are prevalent? How involved do we become as a person who has a transformed heart? It's renewed by the grace of God. We've accepted his grace and his love into our hearts and lives. And so we thus want to honor him. This is a New Testament verse, and it's applicable for our day today. Another reason for this message, as I was <clears throat> preparing and thinking about what God wants or what he, the Lord wanted for us to preach upon, <clears throat> um, I received a book that I haven't read anything in, but the title spoke to me as I was thinking and preparing. The title of it is Historical Drift. I don't know what it all talks about, but it, I definitely had to go to the thoughts that I was thinking of <clears throat> the number of years already. And I guess I could say that the reason some of these things are impressive to me is because of my upbringing. I don't know if you all know that, but I grew up in a setting where it was supposed to be plain, but we did things that were not right in the home. Um, we used to go every year out to Kokomo, and we would go to the rich section, and we would spend the whole evening just looking at the lights and just uh, allowing that to for our enjoyment. And it was for the pleasure of our sight, the pleasure of enjoying those beautiful things that are natural. Secondly, as long as I can remember, we had a Christmas tree in the home. It was probably about three foot tall. We'd always disassemble it and then reassemble it and get it ready for Christmas time. And of course, when the new house was built, that wasn't big enough. We needed a bigger one. We had one that was probably six foot high. We had, it was a silver one. And in that day, in those days, that was kind of popular to have a silver one and have a, a colored light shining on it. Four different colors. It would rotate and it would change. And then eventually we had string lights also. That's the setting I grew up with. But you know, after I became a Christian, I started realizing what some of the others 
uh, were doing and what some of the people of God were doing. And I had to unlearn some of those things, just as I unlearned a lot of the things in high school, some of the philosophies that they taught in government class and in history class and in relationship classes. I had to unlearn those things because I was a child of God. And we can do that. And likewise, I like to maintain those standards that I came from or maintain the standards that I changed for future generations' sake. And the third thing that happened that verified I needed to share this message this morning was we got a... <clears throat> We got a message sent to us by a friend, and I think he sent it as a joke. They were out looking at Christmas lights also, and then he sent us this message. And I'll just let you decide what it was. He said he wants to show us some Amish Christmas lights. Amish Christmas lights. Is it a joke? The longer I looked at it, I thought, that's what it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be for the Christmas season. No lights. That which glorifies our experience of this Christmas season should be that which brings out the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is for. <clears throat> it's a demonstration of refraining from the world's view of the Christmas season. How are we doing? What is the depth of your commitment to Jesus? If we're becoming involved in such things in the natural ways, could it be possible that worldliness is slipping in spiritual, into our spiritual reasonings and church life also? Drift. Are we drifting little by little? is becoming a part of us, the world's view of, Christian, uh, of Christmas. I'd like to look at briefly at the characteristics of a separated life. First of all, a spirit-filled and a spirit-led life. And we find some of those thoughts in Romans 8, 8, and 9. I'll just read those at this time. There it says, so they that were in the flesh cannot please God. But they, ye who are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if it so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. A separated life consists of a spirit filled life and a spirit led life. Is God leading us, or is the Holy Spirit leading us to put up a Christmas tree? Is the Holy Spirit uh, drawing us to bring glory to ourselves or mankind with the beauty of the things that he has, uh, that mankind can show? I'm reminded of Wendell's statement the other evening of how he was approaching Sheep Shawana and he seen the lights of joy but over top of that, he's seen a beautiful sunset that far exceeds the beauty that he was seeing in the joys, uh, in the lights of joy. And I just, and then on the way to work on Friday <clears throat> morning, it was a clear morning, and it was a day before the full moon, and the full moon was there visible in the sky, bright. I, my heart, had just, I just had to rejoice and praise him as I looked at that beauty. We talked about the beauty of, or Walt was talking about the beauty of the universe and those things that God set in place and the moon and its brightness just glorified God, a light that was fantastic. Another <clears throat> characteristic of a separated life is an obedient life. Uh, we find that in 
Matthew 7, 21. I need to hurry on. Um, <clears throat> another characteristic is an humble life. In 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Another characteristic is a life yoked with Christ. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and I will give you rest. Being yoked with Christ, having that connection, and that's the thing that touches our heart about the, the, um, refu uh, the um, ones that were released, how that being yoked with Christ and being led by the Spirit, God could work things out and made it possible that they could escape. Another characteristic the joy of the Lord versus the joy of the world. The joy of the world would like to show all kinds of fantastic lights and displays. But the peace of God within far outweighs all those things. It's a joy that's not only now, but can be for eternity. In Shipshawana, when they turn the lights out, it's dark. But you know, you have the joy of the Lord. When it's dark, you have a joy. It goes on. Not only now, but in eternity. <clears throat> the nonconformed life has a blessed hope. As we surrender our lives to him, there's a hope that's beyond that's coming. We can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. As I think of those things, we ask the question, should we keep the holiday? Some would say that we shouldn't. I remember the first encounter I had with someone, and it was a and a Baptist person. He said, we don't, it's, a lot of the things are pagan, and so we don't keep it. In fact, we go out and we make sure we work so that others can see that we're not keeping the day. I had a struggle with that. I still have today. I'm not sure if that's a correct attitude as we is that really witnessing, possibly? <coughs> should we keep the day or shouldn't we? <clears throat> the 25th of December was set by Pope Liberius to coincide with the sun-worshipping Romans' feast of the sun god. Some would say it's set by the Catholics, so we shouldn't be keeping it. Um, I don't know if that's an excuse or if, or what it is. I don't think it's a right reason. Maybe they did set it that time. Maybe Pope Liberius done it, but he set it up for not to worship the sun god, but in accordance to it so that there would be a greater participation. Another thought along with that of the Pope is the name of Christmas as it has its origin in the Catholic festival, Christ Mass. Talking about having a service or a recognition of Christ's birth. And that's where it became Christmas, the name. That's on December 25th. But wait, look at this. The Austrians, the Belgians, the Bulgarians, the French, Germans, Greeks, Hungarians, Italians, Dutch, and Swiss celebrate Christ's birthday on January 6th. That's most of Europe. And it's interesting here that it mentions Italians because Rome is in Italy, and they had set it at the 25th. <clears throat> As I thought of that, I thought, could it be this be the part of why the Amish keep January 6th, along with Epiphany? Epiphany is when 
supposedly the Magi revealed Jesus' birth and came and worshipped him. None of these things are concrete that we know of. They, gave, they give an honest guess, probably. So should we keep the day? Because we don't know if it was the day Jesus was born or not. <clears throat> In answer to this question, I would like to suggest this. On December 25th is Christmas or June or January 6th celebrates both of those dates celebrate the birth of Christ. <clears throat> In Luke 2 verses 1 to 17 we have the facts related in scripture of Jesus' birth. And in Matthew chapters 1 and 2, we notice that the angel of the Lord made known that this which was born is a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It was the Messiah. It was related by God himself through his messenger, an angel. So we believe that Christ was born. And there had to be a date. We don't necessarily need to know that. But the thing I think about is if we have a government that allows us to keep the celebration of Christ's birth, why not do it? There are many places in the world that cannot even have the Bible, let alone the story of Jesus' birth. Or the teachings that he gave. Let's count our blessings and keep it as a way that glorifies God. Let's honor him through this Christmas season and give him praise. <clears throat> we all know that redemption was wrought by the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. But it would not have been able to happen if he would have not have been born. God is a God of order. We know that. We can see it clear through the Bible. Step by step. We even sense that in the ones that were taken captive as they step by step used God's leading to bring them out. First, we notice there's birth through when Jesus was born. Then there was teaching before the sacrifice. So God has an order for things. This morning, we need to look at our own selves. Let's accept those things that God has brought for us and to do them in a way that glorifies him and not conforms to the physical desires of mankind, that of allowing our emotions to be stirred through lights, through Christmas trees, through things that honor mankind. And I wonder sometimes if our senses aren't stirred in many church buildings. I, we've seen that in Romania. Many church buildings are geared to have our senses escalated with stained glass windows, with sayings on the wall or painted pictures, and etc. to stimulate our devotion to God when it needs to come from the heart. What celebrations should separated people of nonconformity to the world be involved in? What can we do that would glorify God in this Christmas season? And I think we have seen some of that, or we have done some of that already, and I'm thankful for that. And I like to say, uh, I was going to say that earlier already. I, really, these things I'm pointing out to help us to carry on the vision and to um, help our generations after us. If 
God should give us opportunity for that. <clears throat> it's not that I see any flaws in our congregation because of, and in these areas, but we need to be reminded to keep us from drift so that we remain strong. One of the things that we can do is singing songs about the birth of Jesus to ourselves to reiterate the truth in our minds. And it is a good opportunity at a receptive time <clears throat> to the many outside of the church community, like caroling, which we're doing, which was done last night, praise God. I wish I could have been there. People aren't expecting professionalism, but appreciate that they are thought of. It's not that they're looking for the finest tunes and the finest way of doing it, but the thought of just sharing gospel and song is a blessing to them and can speak to their hearts. Hearts that are cold and hard can be softened through song. Let's give our opportunities, uh, use our opportunities to do those things that, if we can. And we have been doing that. I want to give God the glory for that. Other thing, another thing we can do is give gifts of kindness and cards. A platter of cookies, fruit, or candy mean a lot, especially to older people or to those who uh, do not know the Lord, your neighbors, others in the community that don't go to church. Give them a platter of cookies and fruit. Put a little note in, or maybe a verse that would speak to their heart. Another area is the letters, cards, and visitation in the area of giving gifts of kindness. Cards speak. Letters speak. Just share. It takes time to do these things, but the time can be well worth it. It costs to put a stamp on or maybe just deliver them so that you don't have to put a stamp on it. Visitation. Visit them. This day of COVID has hindered our visitation quite strongly. But let's not let it slip. Let's not let it drift away. Let's get it to come back. Keep it in mind. Someday we'll be over this and we can freely visit like we'd like to. <clears throat> Another thought about cards. Cards that are made bring special blessings. I have a sister-in-law that uh, makes many cards and they're beautiful. She spends a lot of time and it's a lot of creativity put into it. What a blessing it is. And it adds a special touch to your card that you send. You can add your own words rather than that which the printer put on. And then there's another aspect of the handmade cards. Have your children make cards. Grandparents especially enjoy grandchildren's cards that they've made. They're little scribblings. They're unorthodox tractors. And what else that they make sometimes warms the heart. And I believe it can do the same for others. They know they're thought of. Have your children involved in these things. <clears throat> Remember the poor. The poor have need of our gifts. The hungry have need of our food. And, this, and the discouraged have need of our calls. Are we doing that? Can we do that? Scripture talks a lot about the poor. Back in the Old Testament times, the corners were not to be reaped so that the poor could gain from that or have something to eat from there. You were not to rob the poor. That brought great 
punishment to you. If the people didn't do it, God did. He took away some of the blessings you had. The poor, we are to remember, let's meet their needs. Maybe those that are poor in spirit, those that don't have the word of God, those that know, don't know the gift of salvation. Let's remember them, share with them, and pray for them. But should we only do this once a year at Christmas time? Or shouldn't a truly separated heart desire to do it all the time? Have it a part of our life, doing it continually, and especially on Christmas. It's kind of like church house cleaning, spring cleaning, and fall cleaning. We clean every week, but we have a special cleaning a couple times a year or one time a year. Let's do it that way as we remember the things that we can do. Another thing we can do is worship and thank God for the gift of salvation to mankind. Just praise him for what he has done. <clears throat> Where would we be without his salvation? Four letters. Lost. That's where we would be. Without hope. Where would we be without his salvation in eternity? We'd be like the rich man that was asking for one drip drop of water on his tongue and how much would that do because he was talking about it in a flame of fire one drop but salvation can bring grace peace and love and mercy and a being with Jesus and God Almighty throughout eternity because he lost he loved us and he gave his life for us and redeemed us if we allow it to be a part of our life. Can I lift up holy hands without fear and doubt? Have I praised him today? Do I trust him? He's worthy to be trusted. He's proven himself time and time again. <clears throat> I believe we can display things that complement and honor the winter season that would not be out of place, that would honor God. Pine branches are complementary to winter. Snow is a blessing and beautiful in a winter season. So artificial snow on your pine branches glorifies the Creator because it shows us one of his seasons that he has created. And he said he's going to maintain those until the world ends. Reese portray God's creation. I don't think that's out of place. I know some would say that Reese instituted or came to pass on by a pagan origin. And I believe if you look at a lot of Things out of Egypt, they have a lot of those, not, yeah, Egypt, a lot of wreaths in those times, in the times of the uh, pharaohs and so forth. But as you take God's created thing of pine and different other things, things that uh, glorify God, plants, and we add that, I believe, can be something that bring glory to God. Ice skates and sleds are not out of place. There are those things that typify the winter season. Candles can be part of the season too. Um, there's longer darkness in the night. And so candles give light. And of course, we talk about candles in scripture of not hiding them under a bushel, but letting it out so that it be gives light unto the world. 
And we as people, as Christians, as separated people, need to be candles into the world, lights that show and demonstrate the plan of salvation and how Christians ought to live, not only at Christmas time, but throughout this whole year. Blankets, a significant sign of warmth on our cold times. Those are things, displaying of blankets can be a, that which I believe can possibly glorify God. And there can be many, many more, I believe, that verify the winter season, but that do not and are not instituted by the world casting its reflections upon us. Things that bring glory to God's winter season. <clears throat> I'd like to now, in closing yet, need to hurry, turn to Jeremiah 10. And I'd just like to read a few things here <clears throat> about what about a Christmas tree and the many lights? Jeremiah 10, verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with nails and hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speaketh not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good, for as much as there is none like unto thee, O God. Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. As far as I've chosen to read, <clears throat> learn not the way of the heathen. Again, verifying that thought from the beginning to be a separated people, not be conformed to the world. The customs of the people are vain. It's that which pleases themselves. This tree was cut out of the forest. And they make it so it don't fall over. They deck it with silver and gold. Tinsel. Or today's lights, bulbs that glow, many other things. Does any of the... And, and then... To top it off, they put a star or an angel on top. Is that what makes it more righteous? <clears throat> As I think of that, does it resemble the Christmas tree of today or of times past? I believe it does. <clears throat> and then, what else goes along with that Christmas tree many times? Many gifts have to be around the bottom, or it's not complete. Many times, gifts that you don't really need to the children. <clears throat> Sometimes gifts that are jokes, like the one I got one time, a big box, and I was anxious to know what was in it. And it was full of corn cobs. Much laughter. It was a joke, but it hurt. It still feels felt today. I know how I felt then. Disappointment. Gifts that we don't need. We in our family, after growing and changing our ways in these ways, we decided to give gifts on their birthdays. Better gifts, gifts they needed on their birthdays. And it was more affordable that way, better on the budget. <clears throat> and now, as we 
as Christmas approaches and so on, we want to give gifts to the poor. We have a real blessing in our day and age, and that's we have organizations that we can give and programs that we can use to give gifts to those that are poor and needy around the world. And we like to do that. We gather together and we assemble these so that they can be, and give them, give them to the organizations so that they can be sent out. What a blessing. What a way that brings honor and glory to God in a Christmas season. It's much more rewarding gift experience and a teaching lesson to your children. Now in this portion of scripture, I was amazed. Many modern commentators and theologians will liken this portion of scripture to making a totem pole type of idol. And I know the rest of the portion of scripture talks about having idols. But can a Christmas tree be an idol? The way that we look at a Christmas tree, not necessarily a totem pole. I can understand why they don't want it related to the Christmas tree because they want it to be a part of their life. They want to experience the Christmas tree. Stringing colorful lights. Maybe that's coming closer home or just regular lights. It's pleasing to the senses, but is it a glory to the birth of Christ? In closing, little by little, it seems like we are inching or drifting as Anabaptists to accept the way of the heathen, as Jeremiah speaks of in the Christmas season. It tells, Again, going back to our first verse. And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your heart. Be a separated people, bringing honor and glory this Christmas season. Shall we stand for prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we commit this message to you that you would work in each one of my, my heart and in all those who have been able to hear it, that we would reconsider our ways, take inventory. Are we getting, are we drifting? Are we getting closer to the way of the world and allowing it to be a part of our lives? Help us, Lord, to be, as we have seen, one that has the Amish Christmas lights, one that's not an outward thing, but one that has an experience within and a relationship with you, glorifying thee, bringing forth truth about the birth of Christ and not the glory of man. Father, we pray that you would just bless these words to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen.